Yep. Welcome everyone to Ladder Daily Digest. We honor creators and today we have a special guest, Kevin Hinckley, who has a, sort of some things to say about religion, about being religious. We'd like to invite Kevin on our show and, you know, how are you doing today? I, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, so it's the, the value of community is the main thing that we're going to be talking about. Give us your um, five-minute story of things that impressed you going up that made you the man you are today? That, that, that's a good question. Because I I grew up uh, in uh, Layton, Utah, and uh, my, my dad was bishop in the in the small town where there's only one stake and just a few wards. Serving a mission and then going to uh, BYU and uh, getting a degree in counseling psychology. I'm a uh, clinical therapist. Where'd you uh, go on your mission? Uh, England. Oh. Man Manchester, England. Uh, nice. So, so growing up in what I call the obedience eighties at BYU meant that we were very much in that uh, uh, simplicity, uh, obedience focused uh, time. I think in church's history. Um, I think that was the beginning of needing a beard card in order to have facial hair on campus. You did. And, and women weren't, weren't supposed to wear pants. They had to wear dresses. Um, and, you know, unless we got a... You know the this, this story behind that? <laughs> I do. I was there for, you, for the fact. You when, were there? I was there. Yeah, when... Uh, Jean, do you know what? Or We can go ahead and let... Yeah, so there... Go, do you want to tell it, Kevin? Or I, I can, I can tell you what happened is that it came out in the, in the universe that next week that on a very cold day, a girl had wore... Uh, her her pants to the testing center and they wouldn't let her into the testing center. Uh, so she went out to the bathroom, excused herself, took her pants off. And so she, now she's going yep. back into the testing center just wearing a long coat uh, and took the test, said that she froze to death while she was taking the test, but then went ahead and wrote this scathing article in the Daily Universe uh, about how she'd had to uh, take her take her test without her pants on. Because otherwise yeah. she couldn't take she couldn't take her final, right? And just the absurdity of the fact that she was more covered before, whereas afterwards, just because sometimes with a long coat and uh, you know a, a skirt that isn't longer or maybe just peeks out from under, there's yeah, it's it's bare legged gives the appearance of wearing a skirt which was more modest, and and that's still a thing at BYU today with the honor code, or at least um, I mean it's been a good decade since I was there and I was at the Hawaii campus, but the standards. The testing center was the way really to enforce a lot of the grooming standards, I think. So, yeah, Including men. Their length and. Yeah, and they had to shave. Other things, that's right. They would get turned away or given razors, I've heard. to Yeah, so if you that's if right. there was something about you that was not fitting in, your grades are on the line because you you would not be able to test for your subjects. Um, if uh, and, and the people at the desk had the power to do that, too turn you away. So that's including, still including, including testing the, the, the length of your dress was all, was also in there. So. Oh, I, yeah. I bet it was, I bet it was. Yeah. So sorry, go ahead, continue. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, it, it's growing up in that period of time, but then also, uh, and then uh, serving as a work again, working as a clinical therapist that also serving as a Bishop in the, in the mid nineties. Uh, watching the progression, I think, of some of that top-down, authority-driven obedience thing start to recede a little bit as we've gotten new generations of coming from uh, President Hinckley and, and then others where we've started to, to push back about all of that. And in some ways, some people have talked sometimes about history as a foreign country. And, and certainly the church that we look at in the 60s, 70s, and 80s is almost as foreign then as, as maybe the church in the 1850s, 1860s, 1870s, uh, because the traditions and everything are, are uh, so different. So we actually live in, in, uh, in a good time, I think, where we're, we're continuing to open that up uh, with uh, kind of ongoing revelation that is moving the church in some interesting directions. Yeah, I think that the correlation started in the 60s and then to the people, to the leaders in the 80s, maybe they thought that meant instead of just correlating the lessons, we should correlate everyone's behavior. 
Well, there, there was certainly, if you think about the uh, kind of the long shadow that we had of in, in the, in the history of uh, kind of Joseph Fielding Smith, Ezra Tapp Benson, uh, when we get Bruce R. McConkey, Delbert Stapley, Marky Peterson, there is a very dogmatic Boyd K. Packer comes out of that, that period of time is very top down dogmatic kind of thing. And obedience was an authority and keys uh, were right up there with uh, the believing blood that got to decide about who was going to accept the gospel and who was going to reject the gospel. Uh, all of those set, sets up kind of a, a battle. And then, you, you know, you're talk, talking early about some of those the uh, those were excommunicated that were starting to push back against the September six, the September six, yeah, yeah, those people. So that that, that does in some ways feel like a foreign country to to maybe kids being raised today that don't realize kind of that the church was going through some growing pains. And I suppose there are some <laughs> vestiges still, like when Dallin Oaks says you have to take the sacrament with your right hand, or else like doesn't work. Yeah. I don't know. What I want to know, Kevin, is this being at BYU during this time, is that kind of, I, I assume, did that have a big impact on you at the time? Or is it something that kind of more later you retro, like retrospectively look at? And I, I, I think I drank the Kool-Aid pretty good in the, in the 80s. I think that's what I heard. That's what I believed in the psychology department. Uh, shoot, I was, I was in graduate school at BYU when we were doing conversion therapy for LGBT people because that was kind of the cutting edge of how you'd help kind of reclaim somebody and help straighten them out. Um, so and you you believed in that and the, Oh, sorry. I wanted, so you believed in that. And then I assume I like when the woman who went to the testing center wrote her piece about not having pants on, were you, were you scandalized and, and thinking this is a, a disobedient Jezebel spirited woman? Um, or were you like, no, actually it doesn't make sense. Where were you on that? It was just, no, it was that part. It's like seeing the absurdity of the lengths at which we were, we were taking yeah. that. Um, but the conversion then, therapy, you were more in line with that. And and that would be the norm for the, the time, the understanding. And, and I was wondering, did you hear that there had been electroshock therapy? Yeah. in the 70s oh, I, yeah I was, well it's not so much electroshock uh because i had uh i was working in the mental health center uh in provo in the in the mid 80s and and so it wasn't it wasn't so much, it was aversion therapy so there were electrodes placed in very tender places and then kind of conditioning responses to, again to try and because the, the belief for lgbt at the time was is that it was it, it had it was a conditioned response to abuse or to mm -hmm. uh, distant fathers growing up or or something. It wasn't real. It was just the fact that environmental things had conditioned that response in. So the 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 belief was is that we can condition it out. We can use behavioral techniques uh, to do that based on the idea that th they really didn't grow up that way. They learned it somewhere. Let's unlearn it. Uh, okay. And at the time, that sort of made sense in terms of the information that we had. Uh, but now you look back on it. Uh, I presented that to a group of YSAs just uh, the other night. And I put a screen uh, slide up talking about conversion therapy. And I had an audible yeah. gasp in the in the class. I went, oh, really? I no idea. No, they had no, no idea. And they were just horrified that anybody would even think down that road and just shows mm -hmm. you how far, and this is a group of active YSAs. So that shows you how far we have come in terms of our understanding, for instance, yeah. of same sex attraction and, and what is therapeutic. Must have sounded equivalent to like leeches yeah. or something else, you know, medically. Well, it, so as I sit here now, it still does. <laughs> it still <Yeah. laughs> things that backwards, you know, so where does the flip happen for you where you uh, like it's kind of go off the track a little bit? Uh, the, yeah, yeah. The, the flip was right about the time that I uh, I was called as a bishop. Um, I, I read uh, Believing Christ, Stephen Robinson. And suddenly you had this completely different viewpoint of saying, maybe it's not about obedience to get you into heaven, but maybe it's about Christ who changes 
who you are. Uh, and that's what it is that, that's needed. And, and that started, that started the dialogue for me that I, as I've been working with a variety of people that maybe we'd been looking at this different, differently. Um, but it really didn't crystallize for me until a number of years ago, uh, when we got, uh, Terrell Givens, who started to be able to frame, uh, the history of Christianity and where we go back to us, the, the concept of sin is the problem rather than, uh, needing to just kind of be altered and changed, become new people. And, and that, that's really a dynamic, massive shift in our, the way we think, because so much of, of the church today still has a lot of roots back to that, that Christianity and back to the fourth century under Augustine, uh, talking about the fact that it's about sin and how to get to heaven and who determines how you get to heaven. And, and, uh, who's going to be worthy and who gets to decide it and what do you got to do to pay for your sins? And there's all of that. And we've kind of brought that baggage into kind of the, the Mormon culture. Uh, we, we hear it in our sacrament songs. It's all about kind of paying who's going to pay and all that. And, it, it, I, and I felt as a missionary, we, you know, so it's the thing where we, we profess of Christ. Like we speak of him. That was something that, as a missionary, I know we got kind of accused of a lot of times was not being Christian or not following, you know, the right Jesus Christ. Right. And so, and I always had such a problem with that, but over time you kind of, you start to see the point and how differently we view Christ. So we, we talk about the atonement and what it does all the time, but there's still so much, I think, focus on the obedience um, that that really, the, the over-focus on obedience tends to overshadow the atonement because the point of the atonement is to feel free from that guilt. But Mormonism kind of sometimes really grinds it in even more, even more deeply. Well, and that's what Stephen Robinson was the first one to frame really nicely. The fact that uh, we were going to basically save ourselves and we needed Christ only at the end to get us over the top for, for the things that we couldn't do. Uh, or like when I was growing up, repentance was about the, the seven R's you know, that you were going to have to do um, a recognition and then you're going to have to do a restoration and you have to, you know, and repenting was all the things that I did. And it was uh, Brother Robinson that talked very uh, succinctly about the fact that the seven R's didn't include the, the most important R, which was Redeemer. That somehow mm -hmm. we could we could do all this. And, and I think it was pointed by the, the story he told about the girl that, grabbed her bishop as he was walking into sacrament meeting. She's and she said, I need to talk to you for just a second. And he said, what? And she says, well, I slept with my boyfriend last night. I've done all of the other uh, repentance things. I just need to report this to the bishop so I can go ahead and take the sacrament. You know, so it was, it was like yeah. a checklist <laughs> repentance. And yeah. but that was, that was a direct artifact coming out of that obedience driven time where it was about, about what we did not what President it, Oaks said, what we become, right? Yeah. It's funny because we would judge other religions, more specifically the Catholic Church, as I recall, really harshly for that kind of thinking that you could do some, you know, uh, Hail Marys or, you know, our, our fathers or pay a penance, pay some money and be forgiven. Those Death were all bed. like kind of worldly things. Deathbed repentance. Yeah. 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 Which is really, again, it's funny we end up century. doing it. It's a fourth century yeah. artifact of we're going to we're going to do penance. Penance was what was coming in the Vulgate in the fourth century about because the early church under Paul and that they believed that heaven was already here. You join the body of Christ. You were creating heaven and heaven would come to you. So that early church was about taking care of one another, eating together, but also taking care of your neighbors that sense of community was, and that heaven was coming to us as, as Christianity was being codified into the Roman empire. Now it was going to be about standardizing it and controlling that to the point that now it was going to take the church to decide a number of things. Um, and it was more about then being worthy and being clean as opposed to taking care of your community and taking care of one another. 
That's and right. we'll be here. And we've created heaven in this little house church in Thessalonica or Ephesus. Um, and, yeah, we're, and we're here we're waiting. Communion and community are uh, have the same root. They do. They do. And and that's part of what that obedience driven thing had, had kind of obfuscated, I think, uh, the fact that the most important thing we were going to do was love one another and take care of one another, uh, which was what Eugene England was trying to to say um, when he wrote his essay on the, the, the church is as true as the gospel. Because like in a geographical sense, we're going to create a ward. We're going to put everybody in a geographical area together with people you wouldn't associate with, you wouldn't spend any time with. And not only would you have to worship with them, but you got to go serve them. you got to let them serve you. you got to serve alongside them and learn how to get along. And, and uh, maybe you, you would have seen that in, in uh, Hawaii. It's like, oh, my gosh, all of these cultures coming together. And we got to learn to get along with, with all of our differences. Yeah. So how, so this was the change for you was that book. Um, so did you start bishoping differently or how did, uh, what, what could we see or, or, you know, that you did differently? How did it affect your day to day? The, the one thing that I remember that, that did change right at that time was a sense of, um, that, and, and Terrell Givens actually has done the research where he kind of nailed down what I had sensed. And that was that uh, what I what I tend to call, and I, I keep thinking about, I'm going to write a book called "A Very Crowded Heaven," uh, that that makes me almost a Mormon universalist. That I think almost everybody makes it to the celestial kingdom, um, and that we're going to move our way through the progressively through the kingdoms as we learn more and grow more. Um, and and so that meant then that that opened the door for me about. Um, how the beauties of a lot of the Catholic theologians and what they taught over the centuries, and that you can see the the uh, beauties in other religions and what they bring to the table. Um, and then I brought that into into my office clinically to try and understand, because I do a lot of work with those that have, you know, been through faith crisis and struggling with that. And in in a lot of cases. I, I keep saying to them, I think you're trying to leave a church that never really existed. I think right. you're leaving a church that. And then if you think about it, temple work, the whole purpose of temple work is to unite everyone together. It is. Yeah. Yeah. But but like, for instance, if I when I show people a, a graph about where I think we're trying to go, ultimately, it's really about being reunited with. Our, our heavenly parents. Uh, the original, the original framing in the uh, in the Greek uh, of Romans seven that talks about the first word that time uh, t the word atonement is used by William Tyndale. Uh, he changed the word from from reconciliation. We're being reconciled. We're being brought together. He changed that to atonement, meaning at one. But in in our current day, atone means for means pay for, do penance. That that wasn't that wasn't the original meaning of that word. It meant to be reconciled, which means we have been lost and now we're found. We're, we've been brought back. Um, so that means then that we're trying to now bring people into a communion of 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 a, of a group of people, and and hold them close. And, and not drive them away. So when you say you dealt with people who were going through faith crisis and they were trying to leave a church that didn't exist, are you, are you saying they they were like misinterpreting their church experience or they, they were overly focused on the obedience part and you were trying to get them to think about Jesus kind of? Maven, here, here's the really challenging part of that is that a lot of times when they're saying that they're they were leaving they were leaving the church that was so obedience driven that that was their, their uh, lived experience. It was, they heard mm. it from the pulpit. They heard it from general conference. They read it in Mormon doctrine. It was, it was there. And so, so I'm trying to say, 
I don't, I, th we're trying to, we're trying to pull you into a church that still has some of those traditional ways of framing it, but really it's the gospel that has always existed that, that was, have been interpreted over the decades into something that was more traditional controlling Christianity. And, and yet if we can, the real church in my mind is the one that has at its core, the gospel of Jesus Christ and taking one another and being interested in our growth, not, not, and not spending so much time on our worthiness, which would take care of itself. Yeah. Because, the first that, greatest commandment, right? Yeah. Well, and then when I, when I show people on a graph, what is the purpose of the commandments? And I, and Patrick Mason has framed this really nicely. I think the purpose of the commandments is to teach us how to love the yeah, purpose of the commandments, is not teach each other. how to, you know, to score enough points to make celestial kingdom or, you know, 85% maybe gets you the terrestrial, but the purpose of, of the commandments is to teach us how to love Steve Young's new book on the law of love also really carves that out and says that's, it's really all about love, period, period. It's, it's, that, it's that simple. And then the commandments serve that purpose to teach us how to. That's right. Okay. Peter Bleakley in the UK, a UK podcaster, he sort of depicts the dichotomy as the Pharisees against the Christians within the Mormon church. It's a Mormon civil war that's going on. It's the yeah. people that are all about the law versus the people that want to be more loving like Christ. If, if you look at the LGBT community, Michael Wilcox talks really nicely about the pride neighborhood fighting the proclamation neighborhood, <laughs> you know, and, mm. and somewhere in that middle is most of us wrestling with how do we love them and serve them under the present circumstance. But we, we are pretty polarized on, on those kind of things. And we're being divided at a time when we're, when we need to be one, we need to not be separated out. But as long as we're going to do it based on worthiness or, or something like that, we'll have a tendency to, to separate that out. So is this shift kind of where you're at today or, or is there another um, layer, another act to this story, to this arc, or do you want to go into maybe what you've learned and, and what, what do you wish our audience would take away from this and, and learn from, from your experience? That's, that, that, that's a good question. Uh, because I, I think, I think if we start seeing uh, love at the core of all of this, I think it changes uh, our experience of what, what uh, our, our church experience should be. Uh, and that is, uh, you know, I, I love, for instance, guys, to be honest with you, uh, in our in our YSA ward uh, here in Dallas, I have a uh, the, every week we have a, a sacrament being passed by uh, kids that have tattoos uh, that may have dreadlocks uh, that are coming from just this wide variety of of experiences, and we're trying to figure out a way then to say how do we see people right where they are and they're. And, and so many of their lived experiences are not coming from a two-parent, seven-generation pioneer home, but they're coming from first-generation uh, immigrants, um, and from, they're coming from Africa, they're coming from Guatemala. We've got them all kind of in there together. And, and so we're trying to, to then say, how do we, how do we uh, what, are the, what, what are we looking at in terms of rather than saying what it is that they are uh, deserving of, we're trying to look at and say, what are their needs? So we're, we're asking different questions. What are the needs of where people are at the moment? Uh, so there was, another bishop from, there was another bishop oh. from Texas, Bishop Sam Young. He, oh, okay. um, I grew up with Sam. <laughs> he um, sort of changed the church a little bit and maybe not as, as much as he would have liked, but um, is that an issue that you um, supported, you know, it where is. try to soften the, the bishop's interview a little bit? Yeah, I think because part of what happens, uh, to, my experience, guys, is that that uh, I, I have about 95 percent of my clientele is all LDS. Which, and I would say about half of those are 
paid for with some kind of bishop funds. Uh, so I'm interacting a lot with bishops. Um, I was telling a group uh, just yesterday that uh, I can always tell the first year bishops from the fifth year bishops. The first year bishops are coming in with their own beliefs and ideas about things in their first year. And then by the time they get to their fifth year, they're looking at me and going, I don't have a clue. <laughs> I, I, I know better what I don't know. And I think sometimes some of those first year bishops are, especially if it's the obedience thing, are more likely to ask inappropriate questions uh, that might be uncomfortable. And by the time they get to their fifth year, it, it, I think the questionings are much softer. Um, for instance, I work with um, uh, guys that are struggling with pornography uh, addictions. And, you know, the, the first year bishops are like, man, if you're looking at pornography, we're going to pull your temple recommend and do that. Fifth year bishops are like, man, and they're following my, my lead. Uh, I'm, I'm glad at a lot of times when I'm saying, if these guys struggle with pornography and they're holding a temple recommend, have them go to the temple as, you know, as part of their getting back on the horse kind of thing, because it's just a shift in, in seeing people for where they are rather than holding it up against a, a standard that might be not exactly where people are. So it's, it's providing more space, I think. So the young bishops might be just drawing from their remembrances, their recollections of what happened 20 years ago, instead of maybe what the current zeitgeist is or handbook of instructions or reading the room even. Yeah, if, if you look at kind of the faith stages of starting with simplicity and then moving down to complexity, a lot of our church leaders, uh, the older apostles, uh, stake presidents, uh, Area 70, stuff like that, th they're really kind of the watchmen on the fortress. They have to make sure that the doctrine is pure and they're trying to look for everybody that, that's out there. And they tend to then go back and, well, you know, Bruce R. McConkie said in 1974, you know, and, and they're they're drawing back on some of their roots. And I, I think some of the, the newer bishops are saying that just doesn't feel good. I'm not exactly sure what it is that I'm hearing, but that feels yeah. harsh. It so, feels so I was thinking uh, right of the way. as a follow up to Maven's you know question, like what would be the perfect community? What would be the how should the church be at the ward level? What, what's your vision? Um, I, I was really thrilled to hear um, Tom Christofferson uh, tells the story about uh, living in the avenues of Salt Lake and that they wanted an outreach towards um, the neighborhoods in the area who are uh, overwhelmingly gay and overwhelmingly uh, not member. And, and, the church, and, they, and the church leaders talked about it, and they sent out flyers to say on, I think it was a 4th of July celebration, we want to have everybody get together for a big neighborhood thing at the church parking lot, coffee and tea will be served. Wow. We, we, may, not, we may not drink it, but we know you do, so we want to do something that's going to invite you close. So, so if we were doing that, um, uh, there are the... the, the I would be sending out uh, missionaries to preach the gospel and they would be doing about 80% service. I think right. our, our, just, our involvement in the communities and letting know that we're take, gonna take the forefront of reaching out to people and talking to people and and being involved in, I, I love our, our love our movement. I don't know about where you guys live, but in our area, we have quite a movement going towards uh, interfaith councils and, and inviting Muslims to come uh, celebrate um, uh, their celebrations in our chapels, uh, trying to do Hanukkah together with uh, the, the Jewish population, where our job is to be involved in the people and the communities around us. And I think the church has a lot, is moving in that direction. President Nelson's work with the NAACP, uh, it, we've got to be more, more out there. You know, if, right. there's, if there's a soup kitchen in town, why aren't the Mormons running it? You know, 
Okay, right. I, I remember about 10 years ago or maybe a dozen years ago, for some reason, I was watching reruns of Cheers. Cheers. I was watching Cheers and I was thinking about the song where everyone knows your name and everyone is glad you came. And I was thinking, I don't have that same experience at church. No. And you have to ask mm. why not, mm. you know, and, and I think that's, yeah. that's a searching question for why it is that we struggle with those, with those kind of things. And of all places, it should be a place where true spirituality and, and, and love should exist. And, and if we're struggling with that, it's because we have some of these older artifacts, I think of, of a more Calvinistic Christianity, which was very much, uh, very much about obedience and, and uh, all that. So, and, you know, hearkening back to, uh, the childhood that you and I experienced in the church, there were road shows, there were, you know, um, softball, softball leagues lasted all programs, summer, basketball lasted all dance winter, festival, dance festivals, all kinds of things. So you, would your uh, community bring back uh, as what, as much as we could? Of course, now it'd be like pickleball, I suppose. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> no, we've lost it. And, and I think there is a, there's a sense uh, when I talk to saints that it is nice to go to church for two hours and be able to go home and take a nap, but we have lost our sense of community time in the hall, talking to one another. Um, if we were getting ready to do a, a steak musical, uh, or something like that, that we might be at the church three or four nights a week, uh, which at the time felt like kind of a burden, but we had a sense of community and who we were. Uh, and now, and now, and COVID kind of sped that process up as we really have lost our, our sense of community. So you can see why people aren't as tied in maybe to their ward. Um, I think it's one of the inadvertent uh, casualties of uh, family-focused church-supported uh, programs where mo most of the church is not Two, parent, two active parents teaching, come follow me to their obedient kids sitting around. Most of the church is single parents, widows, uh, all these people for whom the church community may be the most important unifying aspect in their life. And they're losing Makes it. Makes sense. Yeah. They're losing and, it. And I think that one thing that sort of breaks community apart sometimes is a dogmatic approach to what the current belief de jure is. Yeah, well, and talk, talk to a, a generation of especially young women who don't really understand why we can't have uh, female Sunday school presidents or can't have a female executive secretary or ward, or, or, uh, ward clerk. Yeah, I think there was a post on Reddit once uh, where a man talked about his mother being a, an accountant for some Fortune 500 or even like Fortune 100 company, just excellent in her field. And the, the just the fact that she was a woman, though, meant that despite her expertise, despite her, you know, abilities with financials, she would never be allowed to touch money in the church. Uh, Couldn't be a work is. clerk. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that was kind of st striking to me to think about. Yeah. And, and it really doesn't make sense to us that less and less anymore. I mean, even when I was serving a mission and I was at my full all in, I still, there were times where it was still just like, why does it make a difference that why, why is it that you have to have a penis to be able to baptize somebody that you've been teaching and have taught the gospel to like, you know, really, really why, why, why is it that not something that we can do? And it was just something we just had to kind of. So I remember parking as a kid toward the day where um, blacks would receive the priesthood. Um, Kevin, do you hearken for the day where um, women will be, have the equal um, bearers of the priesthood? I, 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 that wouldn't offend me at all uh, on that. Um, I'm probably, probably the thing that I'm hoping for the most, to be honest, is uh, church acceptance of same sex marriage. Um, I don't know about whether we'll ever see it, you know, solemnized in the temple, but I think at least if they've been married legally, um, I, I keep hoping for that. But I just think that there's space there 
especially if we say that the uh, restoration is ongoing, there has to be room for those, those kind of things, you know. I, I think a lot of people see them as related, and I, I think I do too, because when there's when you're really looking at things in a heterosexual way and you've got the man is the priesthood holder and the woman is the help meet, when you bring in homosexual relationships, either you know male or female, you've got the equality is just not something the church is prepared for. It's got to, somebody's got to be the lead. Somebody's got to be the head, and that's the man. So if you have two men, who's the man? Or if you have two women, who's the man? Um, and so that's yeah. I think um, honestly, for that to happen, I think the church does need to get on board with the gender equality, and then it won't matter so much who's married to who. Well, I think. See, but but I, I still remember, Maven. I mean, again, growing up in the '70s and then getting married. We got married about '79, so and then re started raising our kids in the 80s, we're still very much a patriarch oriented, that the, mm -hmm. the husband is gonna be the patriarch in the home. And in a sense, the wife was gonna be like the first counselor the same way as the first counselor is to a bishop. Uh, and it, it's what, one of the fascinating things about people that have a hard time with uh, the family proclamation, they forget that the, there is a line in there that is actually fairly progressive that says even though women are primarily going to be nurturers and men are supposed to be the uh, writers, the, that it says in these duties, they are equal. That's right. Well, that thing sits embedded in there and kind of gets left out. Um, and recently, yeah, I feel like it's meaningless, honestly. And that's why it gets left out because the real message is women do this and men do this. And so I feel like a lot of times the church will do things where it's kind of speaking out of both sides of its mouth, where it'll say, like, we do believe and love thy neighbor, but also there's a conflict with being accepting of your gay family members. And so when, you know, you you can always find quotes that say, and this is why some members of the church will genuinely say that it's a it's an LGBTQ friendly place, when people who are LGBTQ absolutely have not experienced yeah, that right. at there's all. Yeah so, right. it's, yeah, so that's kind of how I feel, like, by by... I feel like the church wants to say it's equal more than it wants to be equal. And and I think we've seen more of that recently with more, more quotes from female leaders that have gotten a lot of public attention. I think because they're trying to do that, they're trying to have their cake and eat it too. Maven, so I, I, think, that's I, think my I, say, I think what I'd say to you is this. Um, I think if you talk about the church community, I think there's a growing sense of really wanting that. I think there's a, but there is in place still a an older uh, hierarchy that was still trained that way, and they don't want to contradict other apostles or their senior president or something like that. We're still kind of holding on to the old stuff, yeah. and, and and I remember I think a lot of young men too. I, I feel like it's split because I, I mean I, I think of people like like Jacob Hansen, honestly, who are I I think quite misogynistic, still very yeah. patriarchal. Um, yeah and still really want to be in control and just, just cannot handle a, an idea of, or Cardinalis was on an episode of Jubilee recently. It was, you know, kind of Mormons versus ex Mormons. Yeah. And when this was brought up, I just, it, it still always stands out in my mind. It was just like, when is the equality enough for you people? Like he did the, he did the whole you people thing. And it was just like, like, what, why have you got, why do you want the priesthood? It always comes down to this. And it was just like, what more do you want from us? What can you possibly want? And it's just like, we want to have a legitimate voice at the table. And yeah. that's what priesthood is and bars us from, but. Yeah. And to me, yeah. that that oh. would make more of a community, right? Where everyone knows your name, everyone's glad you came and and everyone is Everybody gets to real under under the, the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. At any given moment, we, we are that's why I like the uh the faith stages that McLaren has has put together on that. Because I listen to, to someone like Jacob Hansen and I see him very much in simplicity. And then you're gonna watch a, another group here sitting in complexity and they're battling back and forth. Jacob tends to be there. Mm. Underneath that though is perplexity where the walls fall and now we don't believe in anything. We're not gonna believe in the church or God or anything, but he's done a good job of getting to that last stage, which is harmony where there's no walls and we're trying to connect with one another and other churches as well. Uh, but McLaren is also very, very good about saying he thinks that a lot of 
very healthy organizations are not a fourth stage church. They are a four stage church. In other words, the good communities have those in simplicity, have those in complexity, the simplicity people remind, reminding us of the traditions and stuff that might have formed it. The complexity people that kind of are struggling with things, battling things, perplexity mm -hmm. people with doubts. We need doubting people in our in our meetings that are okay. asking questions and driving us to get answers. And then you need the peacemakers, the harmony people that like a said, poor generation we'll figure out how to pull this thing together. Like a poor generation uh, Christmas or Thanksgiving dinner, right? You have you got you them have all. To have yeah. something for everybody. Uh, everyone at the table. <laughs> yeah. I, I, can you imagine, guys, uh, in this election year, what Thanksgiving is going to look like in November? Holy well, cow! It'll be fun. <laughs> We're going to get yeah. all the families together for Thanksgiving. After whatever's going to happen in this election will be, holy cow! You know, it'll be and, interesting for sure. Well, and you know, maybe we should um, maybe we should have an episode about that. <laughs> Some advice. Yeah. Yeah. Surviving for Thanksgiving. Sure. That would be awesome. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so right. it, it yeah bring me back. I'll be ready for that one. And and I'm All thinking right. like to wrap up the show that a lot of people leave the church loudly uh, were against the dogmatic approach. Mm -hmm. and, and but there there is a silent majority of people who leave the church and they look to other places to find community. Yeah. They look to the community of Christ. They look to their neighborhood church. They might even just do something, you know, in the gardening club. They look at social media. Yeah. Yeah. All the other groups. And I think that there there should be and there could be a way to um, have the bigger tent and, and have us all, you know, not seeing Kumbaya or anything like that. But like you say, have a, the four stage all together, you know, church where um, we all can be considered, you know, brothers in Christ, maybe at least. Right. And, and the other things can just be a, a small part of their experience. Yeah. Yeah, I always, to be honest, I always, when, when people uh, decide that they need to step back from the church, on one, one side of me understands that you need to be in a place where you feel more comfortable and you feel more accepted. Uh, the other side, I always mourn a little bit because we've lost your voice. We've lost your contrib contribution. We've lost uh, the, that fact that another uh, opinion could drive a discussion that would be, that would be really helpful. And I always think we're a little poorer uh, when 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 people feel like they need to do that. And again, I understand that, but I think we we lose something in the process. Well, we appreciate you. your voice and, and your contribution to our show, um, especially just because we tend to be on, on on more the opposite side of things. And so I uh, I really appreciate you uh, coming on. And um, and I think we all agree. We've all I mean, we we've been there. I, I know I've been there where I really wanted to see the church get better. And um, I think as long as you still have that hope, and especially if you are in a position like you are, where you can make a difference for people, I, I think that's really great. And the church needs people like you. And I hope that maybe they can do better at keeping, um, you know, people like you and, and like we used to be in longer before it gets to the point where it's too painful and, and there has to be a split. So thank you for coming on the show today. And I hope we do have you back for sure. Anytime guys. And there's even a lot more about Kevin. We'll get to probably in some future episode as he has been to the Holy land and other places like that. Right. About, twi chat. about twice a year. And as long as, as long as uh, Hezbollah and Hamas keep acting out it, that's right. You could give us a virtual tour sometime in the future. So love to do that. everyone, thanks for watching. Uh, like and subscribe and share. And everybody have a great summer. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye now.